Hi, welcome to A Grey Barn Rising. I'm reading the poems this evening of a Japanese poet, Gozo Yoshimasu. He was born in 1939. He's really well known in Japan, but unfortunately he's not as well known in this country as he should be. And uh, I want to read primarily from a book of his that was published by Katie Did Press. Uh, Katie Did was a wonderful press um, outside uh, of, well actually in Rochester, Michigan from Oakland University. And they published uh, under the leadership of Thomas Fitzsimmons a great many books of Japanese poetry in English translation. I'm going to guess there's at least 15, perhaps more. I have most, if not all of them. I may be missing one or two. But this is a book entitled A Thousand Steps and More. And it is Selected Poems and Prose, 1964 to 1984. Gozo, I'm going to refer to him as Gozo because the Japanese surname comes first. I'm not addressing him by his first name. Uh, Gozo is his surname. Gozo is uh, a wild poet, uh, a ritualized poet in many ways, where he performs ritual through uh, a repetition and chanting of his poems when he performs them. He's interested in a, a great many arts, uh, filmmaking, uh, visual arts, and he's, he's, he's made films and has done visual arts uh, himself. He's influenced by people um, as varied as Paul Clay and um, William Blake, the poet William Blake, and the contemporary uh, mu musician uh, John Cage. So those are just some of the influences that you may hear creep into uh, this selection of his work that I'm going to share with you this evening. So this first poem is entitled, Pulling in the Reins. Walking along a river bank in an antiquated, well, I should mention before I do that, the translators are um, Richard Arno, Brenda Barrows, and Takako Lento. And they've translated, they've teamed together to translate this work of Gozo's. Pulling in the reins. Walking along a river bank in an antiquated universe. A tall woman approaches passes me by. She looked like Kudara, the goddess of mercy. Black woman? In the dim light, I couldn't tell. The universe already old, growing older. Japan since the days of the shoguns, like a small boat. Walking along a riverbank, I recall the phrase, mirrors and sex are guilty of increasing the number of people. Eros, everywhere. Ship of death. Seduction. I really admire how Gozo in that poem plays with uh, some of the sparseness of what we normally would consider a Japanese poem as, has come to us through haiku and things like that, but it's, this poem is so contemporary that he plays with that and then works that against and off of uh, contemporary themes and contemporary ideas and even uh, phrases and diction. I like how he complicates our idea of what a Japanese poet is. He goes much further in some of his other poems he is a, a, a poet of great spiritual death in which there appears to be a kind of order within chaos for him. And this is a prose poem, part essay, part poem, and I just simply, it's too long to read the entirety of for you this evening, but I want to share the first paragraph with you because I think it gives more insight into Gozo and his poetics. And it's entitled Arranging Chaos, which again in itself is uh, quite a paradox but speaks to what uh, happens in Gozo's work. I made an altar. Though that is what I say, it's an extremely simple thing. I don't know if it's right or not calling it an altar. I wonder if I should call it a tokonoma, place of honor, arranged in my own style. I went to the woods and gathered 
a handful of plants resembling dead trees. Then I arrange them in the corner of a room with hospital white walls. I think saying, I threw them in the corner, catches the feeling. I left them standing there around a transistor radio. <laughs> so that's, that's Gozo riffing on chaos in his arrangement of chaos. I, I think what one of the things that really comes through for me why I wanted to share that paragraph of prose poem slash essay with you is that um, all of these things that simply seem of the secular world are made sacred for him. Uh, sort of harking back to the, the title of that wonderful Eliade book, The Sacred and the Profane. And I think that The Sacred and the, Pro and the Profane as a great paradox that comes together and commingles is operative when we think of Gozo and his work. Sacrificial fire. Was I dreaming of this corpse? Was I looking for this corpse? Oh, my corpse smolders. Inside my flesh, fresh cells bubble. Pain circulates through my bones like spring. At the base of my neck, the sea murmurs to my hair. A finger, like a spire, cleaves the blazing sunset of the universe, stretches out into far away. Oh, my corpse has not yet rotted. It still smolders in the maze of civilization. Blaze up, my corpse. Out under the rain, turn into a white steel arrow. Turn into a dugout floating in black heaven. There's a playful quality to Gozo's work, mingled with the seriousness. Uh, one of his, his dominant uh, metaphors uh, throughout his work is water and the sea, and you hear this even the boat. And, and I think for Gozo, again, that's the sea of cosmic consciousness. He's a poet of great cosmic reach. Even in these uh, two shorter poems, uh, well, three shorter poems I read for you, the one being a, a paragraph from that prose poem, but the two shorter complete poems that I read for you. This is a longer piece uh, of Gozo's that I want to conclude on this evening. And um, I just adore this piece of his, this poem of his. It's uh, entitled, The First Water. And I think you'll also hear that image of the water uh, and also his exuberance uh, come through in this poem. The first water. Wet. Wet. No one has ever seen it in this world. From deathbed water to the newborn's bath. From the first water to the last water. Mother. Since when did my eyes begin to water? Well, I am so fully soaked. Like a symptom of suspended life. To my eyelids, mother, eyelashes, raft on the shore appear. Wet, spirits of wine, perspiring forehead, all are wet. The visionary continent, which I am used to calling Black Bank, appears to my eyes. Rapids, but not flooding or overflowing. The eyes seem to be rising at the crackled bottom of the rivers. That's a swimming corpse. Someone shouts. I'll bet they're the hungry devils of the other shore. Mother, terribly wet. The soji and all my inner organs inside my head are so hopelessly wet. Mother. The universe warps lightly. Water is leaking somewhere. Is this the rainy season? Deathbed water to the newborn's bath. Newborn's bath to deathbed water. There's nothing left to do. 
a doctor puts his stethoscope on my body to see dry season or wet season drip plop drip plop drip plop drip plop rivers and lips are wet am i a workman at river conservation work as i come to myself i am left alone on the shoal the silver river night falls ah mother i miss the sea <laughs> there's so much exuberance in a gozo poem and particularly in that poem the first water uh, the, just the, the reach of his associative language. He's influenced uh, not only by the poets who I mentioned and the, the other artists, filmmakers and uh, uh, visual artists and musicians, but he's also, uh, as part of that influence, takes on uh, a great influence from the Surrealist poets. And, uh, and Surrealism was popular at one time, uh, particularly in Japan. And uh, he really draws from that. He's just a marvelous uh, poet in that regard. I read from A Thousand Steps and More, the selected poems from Katie Did Press. If you can get any of these Katie Did books, uh, grab them, gobble them up. I did not read from uh, this book, Osiris, the God of Stone, from St. Andrew's Press, but I have to just show it to you. It's one of the most beautiful books I have. The paper is thick and has this wonderful tactile quality and the cover is absolutely gorgeous. I did not read from this book today because some of the poems are longer and I wanted to, to share that particular selection with you, but that's another Gozo book that's available, Osiris the God of Stone. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, us, Bootsy and me, for another episode of A Great Barn Rising.